So all ready? Yes sir. Okay fine, so we'll start. Good evening everybody, welcome to this evening episode of Pursue. And we have Pursue 12E, the fifth lecture on the respiratory pathology. We are streaming live from Kolkata. And we have a very interesting topic and a very competent person to, to discuss this topic. The topic of the day is interstitial lung disease. And to talk on that, we have Dr. Shukantu Chakravarti, who is an MBBS from Kolkata, MD from the famous BJ Medical College, Ahmedabad. He's a histocytopathologist with experts in invasive diagnostic procedure. He's also the NABL lead assessor and the lab director of TSM Diagnostics and a consultant in the famous Kothari Medical Center. He has various publications in national and international journals and is a co-author in the Springer book as well. <coughs> Before I ask Dr. Chakravarti to take over, let me request all of you to please keep your mic muted, your camera off, and please don't share your screen. With this, let's not waste any more time. Let me ask Dr. Chakravarti, sir, please share your screen, and let us start. Just press present now your entire screen and press in the center and share. Yeah, I can see your screen. Just share, just choose your PowerPoint, please. Yeah. Yeah, make it full screen. Yeah, and press that hide thing. Right, we are ready to please start. Yes. yes. Good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm Dr. Shukanta Chakravarti. Uh, thank you all who are joining this live discussion, and thanks to all who will watch it later. And thanks to Dr. Nadim sir for giving me this opportunity. Now straight away going to, uh, to today's topic of interstitial lung disease or ILD. Now what is uh, interstitial lung disease? It is chronic interstitial pulmonary disease. They are a heterogeneous group of disorders characterized predominantly by inflammation and fibrosis of the pulmonary interstitium. Now, how these patients present? They usually uh, present with dyspnea, tachypnea, end inspiratory crackles and eventually cyanosis. But like other restrictive lung diseases, there is not much wheezing or other sign symptoms. And ultimately, there is right heart failure or core pulmonary. Now, what is the etiopathogenesis? I will not go in the detail, but yes, there are environmental factors and most important among them is the association of smoking. ILD is a disease predominantly of smokers. Smoking has a very strong association with interstitial lung disease and then there are some uh, professional uh, factors like farming, hairdressing, stone polishing, this kind of professions are closely related with interstitial lung disease. Then there are of course some genetic factors uh, are, is associated because all the uh, patients or uh, human beings with these environmental factors do not present with interstitial lung disease. So there is telomere defect of the TERT or TART gene. This TERT gene mutation is the most important genetic factor related with interstitial lung disease or ILD. Now it is mostly a disease of the elderly and usually over 50 years of age uh, patients present with interstitial lung disease. Now briefly what are the um, pathogenesis or pathological factors which uh, end up in interstitial lung disease. Now the triggering factors which we have already discussed in the previous slide environmental uh, factors, genetic predisposition, some drugs are related and uh, recently, gastroesophageal reflux has also been associated with ILD. Now, these factors, what 
do uh, what they do there is epithelial damage and also endothelial injury and this epithelial endothelial damage causes destruction of alveolar capillary basement membrane uh, as well as vascular leak platelet activation fibrin clot activation and these things ultimately causes a epithelial fibroblastic interaction and this interaction leads to release of pro fibrotic cytokines and there is myofibroblast recruitment in the uh, ward zone there is proliferation and differentiation of myofibroblast and a provisional matrix formation angiogenesis and defective re-epithelialization this re-epithelialization is not with uh, according to the initial normal uh, physiological state it is defective re-epithelialization and ultimately aberrant or defective repair and fibrosis occurs and there is exaggerated extracellular matrix accumulation lack of matrix degradation progressive lung remodeling and ultimately honeycomb changes these things are in a nutshell the etiopathogenesis of ILD now uh, briefly what is the important subgroups in ILD or which is also called diffuse parenchymal lung disease or DPLD first of all of known causes like drugs dust exposure collagen vascular disease and next the most important group of ILD is idiopathic interstitial pneumonias or IIPs among IIPs there is the most prototypical of ILD is idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis or IPF this is the most famous or most infamous rather I should say group of ILDs IPF or idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis then there is other IIPs like discommative interstitial pneumonia DIP later we will see this is strongly associated with smoking but other subgroups of these IIPs are not that strongly associated with smoking or usually occurs in non-smokers uh, acute interstitial pneumonia AIP non-specific interstitial pneumonia NSIP and bronchiolitis associated ILD cryptogenic organizing pneumonia lymphocytic interstitial pneumonia these are other subtypes of IIP apart from IPF next comes granulomatous group like sarcoidosis, hypersensitive pneumonitis, etc. And there is also other form like eosinophilic pneumonia, etc. So these are in brief subgroups of ILD. Now before going to individual important sub subtypes of ILD, we will quickly discuss few things about indications of lung biopsy in ILD because what uh, I say uh, interstitial lung disease is actually a game between the pulmonologist and radiologist and the surgical pathologist uh, works as a ball boy when the ball comes out of the uh, field uh, then only surgical pathologist have a definite role to play now Lung bi biopsy is generally helpful in the evaluation of patients with ILD in the following situations to provide a specific diagnosis. When lung biopsy is indicated, when age is less than 50, there is fever, weight loss, hemoptysis or signs of vasculitis, there is a progressive course of the disease, atypical or rapidly changing HRCT findings are there and there is unexplained extra pulmonary manifestation or pulmonary vascular disease of unclear origin in these cases biopsy is indicated now what are the options of biopsy in ILD 
first of all fnsc is a simple and very less invasive procedure but in interstitial lung disease we'll discuss later why it is so it can only rule out malignancy or diagnose granulomatous disease at the most next comes surgical lung biopsy with frozen section and another option is video assisted trans thoracic surgery there are options of trans bronchial lung biopsy bronchoscopic core biopsy uh, cryo biopsy and, and lastly core biopsy or trucker biopsy now what are the pitfalls of lung biopsy there is truly speaking gross inter observer variation in some cases even between experts because there are many overlapping features of subgroups of subtypes of interstitial lung disease and radiological features are more definitive in some cases in ild they uh, then there can be sampling error because the involvement of the lung is many a times in many subgroups there is patchy involvement so uh, sampling from one side can give uh, rise to just normal lung biopsy and obviously there will be different impression from biopsy from different sites in many cases and next uh, pitfall is bubble artifact there is a picture of bubble artifact and tissue manipulation can lead to this distortion of the uh, lung tissue and this round spaces we of different sizes with absence of histiocytes and pneumocytes excludes the true pathological process this is the image of a bubble artifact now there is a preferred or uh, default format for reporting the histopathological characteristic of bronchoscopic lung cryobiopsy first of all there should be a gross description of number of specimens and size with maximum di dimension or length and in microscopic description for adequacy we have to report number of fragments number of terminal bronchioles number of alveoli obviously a rough estimate at least and for feedback to the operator bronch presence of bronchial cartilage large airway large vessel pleura etc because this sensitizes the clinician to um, Uh, about the probable complications of the biopsy procedures also and you sh uh, we should report artifacts like alveolar hemorrhage proteinaceous fluid implantation of bronchiolar epithelium in alveolated areas freezing artifact crash artifact collapsed alveolar spaces and finally for diagnosis there should be a morphological description and whenever possible a definitive histopathological diagnosis and we should report also the diagnostic confidence is it definite or it is non diagnostic or it is some somewhere in between like probable or possible next is specimen adequacy i have discussed already in the chart that the specimen of biopsy should be 5 mm or more and uh, it should be Uh, a five millimeter diameter corresponds to a surface area of about twenty millimeter square. So two cores or two such bits would represent a total surface area of forty millimeter square. And as we discussed, a larger biopsy will help in the identification of different histological patchy or focal features like honeycombing, fibroblastic focus, patchy fibrosis, which are typical of a usual. interstitial pneumonia pattern and what is why uip pattern recognition is most important because uip or usual interstitial pneumonia as we will see soon in the next slides it is the histological representation of ipf of idio or idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis so uip pattern which is patchy should be diagnosed or can be diagnosed by only a larger biopsy uh, i have already said this the alveol adequacy should be represented by number of alveoli and greater than 100 is generally considered adequate the presence of sufficient number of terminal bronchioles is also important to diagnose airway centric pathologies such as bronchiolitis or hypersensitivity pneumonitis the presence of 
uh, what I have said, the presence of large arrays, cartilage, large vessels are to provide important feedback to the bronchoscopist and presence of pleura represents subpleural sampling which may be useful in diagnosing idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. So coming to a default diagnostic algorithm of ILD. First of all, history, clinical examination, chest x-ray. If it leads to suspicion or diagnosis of DPLD and in some cases some etiological diagnosis also like sarcoidosis, like collagen vascular disease, then if no diag definitive diagnosis, HRCG chest. If in HRCT there is confirmation of DPLD, then identification or suspicion of certain specific diagnosis if there is there like uh, IPF, like sarcoidosis, like chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis, it is fine. If not, serological test. Serological test will diagnose collagen vascular disease, sarcoidosis again and chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis of a specific allergen or specific cause by diagnosing, diagnosing its specific IgG precipitation. Next in the line is fibro-optic bronchoscopy with examination of ball fluid or bronchoalveolar lavage fluid. We'll have a slide of common ball fluid features of ILD later. But yes, again sarcoidosis comes by increase of lymphocytes and increase CD4, CD8 ratio. And in chronic HP or hypersensitivity pneumonitis, there is decrease in CD4 CD8 ratio. And next comes at the end comes transbronchial lung biopsy where granulomas can be diagnosed easily and other diagnosis if it is achieved then treatment is given accordingly and even after lung biopsy the diagnosis is not clear then there should be a multidisciplinary meeting and if needed a open lung biopsy to cleanse the diagnosis of course it is if it is indicated and necessary for definitive management or prognostication of the patient so with this we conclude the short discussion of the biopsy options or the goal or indications of biopsy in ILD now I will briefly discuss some important subtypes of interstitial lung disease. First of all, uh, as I have said, the prototype is IPF or idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. It is a chronic scarring lung disease characterized by a progressive and irreversible decline in lung function manifested as dyspnea, on exertion and dry cough. So, how idiopathic can be stamped? Of course, by exclusion of known causes of ILD like domestic and occupational environmental exposures, connective tissue diseases or drug exposure or drug toxicity. When we can exclude these known causes, only then unknown or idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis can be stamped. And the presence of a typical radiological pattern of UIP or usual interstitial pneumonia on HRCT is needed to diagnose IPF. And in the right clinical setting, it is possible to make the diagnosis of IPF by HRCT alone, obviating the need for surgical lung biopsy because lung biopsy is not at all easy and not at all easy to diagnose from a small tissue bit and it is actually impossible to diagnose uh, to diagnose alone by histomorphology or histopathology of a small lung bit the specific subtype of ILD without inputs from the clinician without inputs from the bronchoscopy from HRCT etc. So IPF or uh, uh, UIP its histological counterpart, usual interstitial pneumonia and it is also called cryptogenic fibrosing alveolitis. It is the preferred term in European literature, cryptogenic fibrosing alveolitis and histopathology shows 
डिफ्यूज एलवियोलर डैमेज डिफ्यूज एलवियोलर डैमेज पैटर्न डिफ्यूज डैमेज ऑफ द एलवियोलाइ बट द कॉमन फॉर्म इज मिक्स्ड एक्सुडेटिव एंड ऑर्गेनाइजिंग फेज एक्सुडेशन एक्सुडेशन फेज एंड दिस ऑर्गेनाइजिंग फेज टुगेदर इन डिफरेंट एरियाज ऑफ द लंग बायोप्सी इज कैरेक्टरिस्टिक ऑफ यूआईपी एंड what what is so, uh, shown in this picture interstitial edema and hemorrhage is there as you can see interstitial edema and hemorrhage is there in a areas and in b areas there is diffuse alveolar thickening and formation of hyaline membrane and type 2 pneumocyte hyperplasia is there in c areas the all these things are mixed in at the same time in different parts of the biopsy so what is uip in a nutshell little bit of inflammation inflammation is less at spots in ipf there is lower low predominance there is patchy subpleural and paraseptal distribution there is absence of granuloma or dust deposit or eosinophil presence of these things will indicate to a different diagnosis and to differentiate with uip pattern like pattern of connective tissue diseases in rheumatoid arthritis there will be more of inflammation and pleural fibrosis in scleroderma there will be lymphoid nodules commonly and in hypersensitive pneumonitis there will be sensory lobular fibrosis and of course adverse drug reaction can present a uh, uip like picture so drug history is very very important next in ntt is non specific interstitial pneumonia or in short form it is called nsip again to rule out drug induced collagen vascular disease or hypersensitivity first then the histopathology of nsip will come as characterized by a temporally homogeneous inflammatory and fibrosing interstitial process fibroblastic foci and peripheral accentuation are typically absent which helps to differentiate it from usual interstitial pneumonia so first inflammation is more and nsip is also characterized by diffuse alveolar walls thickening by uniform fibrosis but with the preservation of the alveolar architecture so in uip inflammation less but alveolar architecture is damaged in nsip inflammation is more and there is preservation of alveolar architecture and it is prognostically better than ipf or uip so three separate groups within nsip have been described group 1 is mainly of interstitial inflammation and group 2 is a uh, in between thing inflammation and fibrosis together and group 3 is mainly fibrosis so this is a uh, group 2 picture of mixture of inflammation and fibrosis next in line is lymphocytic interstitial pneumonia or lip it is a syndrome of fever cough and dyspnea with bivalvular pulmonary infiltrates consisting of dense interstitial accumulations of lymphocytes and plasma cells so lip there is also association of definitive systemic diseases like autoimmune and lymphoproliferative disorders including ra hashimotos myasthenia gravis pernicious anemia auto erythrocyte sensitization syndrome chronic active hepatitis common variable immunodeficiency jogrens allogenic bone marrow transplantation lupus and lymphoma and we have to diagnose lip we have to when the lymphoid infiltrate is very very dense i'll come to the histological picture then we have to clone, uh, exclude clonality of the lymphoid aggregates to exclude lymphoma and pseudo lymphoma is as we know is a mimicker of lymphoma and it represents a localized mass like variant of 
lymphocytic interstitial pneumonia. So, there is to summarize diffuse interstitial infiltration of polymorphous lymphocytes. If it is monomorphous or monoclonal, then it will be lymphoma. Polymorphous lymphocytes and plasma cells, lymphoid follicles with germinal center, cystocytes and macrophages are often present. Bronchovascular bundles and interlobular septa are usually involved, and alveolar structure is often inflated and disrupted. And typically, CD8 plus or CD4 plus T cells or B cells predominate with an admixture of other lymphocytes. And IHC or molecular is some, uh, sometimes needed, as I said, to confirm polyclonality uh, with this to exclude lymphoma. So, this is histological picture of lymphocytic interstitial pneumonia. We can see dense collection of lymphocytes and plasma cells and in this picture there is some localized aggregates or dense aggregates of lymphocytes. So, this is in short LIP. Now comes some other entities which also gives rise to ILD like picture like pulmonary Langerhans cell histiocytosis or another name is eosinophilic granuloma and now smoking associated entities are coming this is strongly associated with smoking and these there is interstitial involvement so it is uh, it comes in the discussion of ILD and as we know Langerhans cells are uh, these cells are elongated these cells have we can uh, I don't know how clear it is from the picture, but the Langerhans cells are elongated grooved nuclei with glassy pink cytoplasm, elongated grooved nuclei with glassy pink cytoplasm and, and syncytial appearance of staying together and we know they are S100 and CD1A positive and we should remember that this is a subgroup of ILD which occurs in younger patients or young adults, this LCH. Now, quickly, some another uh, some other subgroups of ILD. Aspiration pneumonia can also give rise a picture of interstitial in uh, lung disease. There is uh, the aspiration pneumonia is centered around small bronchioles small bronchiolocentric inflammation and fibrin deposition is there in aspiration pneumonia and in bronchiectasis there is dilatation of the bronchioles and with that there is airway inflammation airway inflammation along with fibrosis these are a very short discussion on some other subtypes of ILD Next comes allergic bronchopulmonary fungal diseases. These are also included in interstitial lung disease and there is mucoid impaction of the bronchi. Mucoid impaction of the bronchi is there in allergic bronchopulmonary fungal diseases and there is bronchocentric granulomatosis. Bronchocentric granulomatosis will be there in fungal bronchopulmonary in ILDs. So, which is left small airway disease like bronchiolitis. There is epithelial sloughing and fibropurulent debris. There is epithelial sloughing and fibropurulent debris will be there in bronchiolitis. And the histological subtypes may be granulomatous, follicular or diffuse pan bronchiolitis where there will be foamy histiocytes in the interstitium. Now, we have more or less covered the IIPs including its most important uh, subgroup of IPF which histologically is Historical counterpart of IP, as I have told repeatedly, is UIP or usual interstitial pneumonia. Now, 
granulometers ILDs uh, will come and among them most important is sarcoidosis. As we all know sarcoidosis is a multi-system disease. It is of unknown etiology and characteristic of sarcoidosis is non-caseting granulomas we all know and there is increased CD4 plus cells in sarcoidosis and there is of course lung, other viscera, skin and eye involvement and histologically apart from non-caseating granulomas another important feature of sarcoidosis will be interstitial fibrosis and there is showman bodies and asteroid bodies characteristically. This is a histological picture of sarcoidosis as we can see beautiful confluent they are merging with one another confluent non caseating granulomas which are called naked granulomas because there is very less lymphocytic cuffing around the collection of epithelioid histiocytes and morphologically epithelioid cells in sarcoidosis are a bit plumper a bit more plump than tubercular uh, epithelioid histiocytes and these are confluent granulomas there is a giant cell in this picture Langhans type of giant cells and these are calcific concretions which are called Schumann bodies which are characteristic of sarcoidosis and there is typical stellate shaped inclusions or star shaped inclusions called asteroid bodies. Next hypersensitivity pneumonitis which I, we, I have named again and again in the discussion of classification or in the discussion of IIPs where always uh, as some specific connective tissue disease, some hypersens uh, some allergens, some drug reactions should be excluded to diagnose the idiopathic conditions or non-specific conditions. Now, what is there in hypersensitivity pneumonitis? First, there can be acute forms, there can be subacute forms, and there can be chronic forms. And subacute forms are mostly biopsied. Acute forms are showing airway-centered inflammation with little fibrosis and neutrophilic infiltration with or without capillaritis is acute hypersensitivity pneumonitis and intra-alveolar fibrin deposition may also be there. These things are common in acute HP and in subacute HP there will be a mixture of acute and chronic form of course and airway centered inflammation will again be there but with fibrosis and lymphocytic infiltration with granulomas or giant cell can be there and in chronic form Predominantly ARA centered inflammation with diffuse fibrotic change. Lymphocytic infiltration will be there with granulomas or giant cells. Granulomas or giant cells can come. And this chronic HP, as we discussed during discussion of the IIPs, they can often overlap with NSIP, UIP, organizing pneumonia, and ARA centered interstitial fibrosis. And bridging fibrosis can be there in chronic HP and fibr what is bridging fibrosis? Fibrotic band connecting bronchioles with each other and with lobular septa. And peribronchial metaplasia can be a diagnostic clue to differentiate between HP and IPF in cases of fibrosis. So these are different subtypes of hypersensitivity pneumonitis histologically acute subacute and chronic so to summarize again what is hypersensitivity pneumonitis it is caused by intense and prolonged exposure continuous intense prolonged exposure to inhaled organic antigens are hypersensitivity pneumonitis and they are immunologically mediated there is increased level of pro-inflammatory cytokines in HP and common culprits of 
HPR, actinomycetes, saprophytic fungal spores, animal and bird proteins, methotrexate as a drug, chemicals like farmers, painters, cheese workers, bird fanciers, rodent workers, air conditioner uh, mechanics, they are more prone to HPEs because these chemicals can give rise to hypersensitivity reaction in the lung. So, interstitial pneumonitis, non casuating granulomas, interstitial fibrosis and in the late stages obliterative bronchiolitis. This characterizes HPs. This is a histological picture of low power view of HP and in a bit higher power we can see the giant cell and some histocytic reactions. Next comes eosinophilic pneumonia. Acute form of eosinophilic pneumonia has diffuse alveolar damage and alveolar and interstitial infiltration by eosinophils, plasma cells and histiocytes are characteristic. And there may be charcot laden crystals in eosinophilic pneumonia and variable angitis, granulomatosis, fibrosis, mucus plugging and bronchiolitis with necrosis can be there. And in chronic form, there is usually some secondary causes like fungus, parasite, rheumatoid arthritis, radiation, smoking, Hodgkin's disease, inflammatory bowel disease, bronchogenic carcinoma. These are common secondary causes of chronic eosinophilic pneumonia. And this is a picture of acute eosinophilic pneumonia. This, the lung parenchyma is studied with eosinophils. Next, uh, some categories are left like acute interstitial pneumonia, discombative interstitial pneumonia which uh, are common in smokers and cryptogenic organizing pneumonia. We will discuss this in my uh, day after tomorrow. I have a presentation on alveolar filling lesions as these two topics of ILD and alveolar filling lesions are overlapping and these things AIP, DIP, cryptogenic organizing pneumonia, they are considered in alveolar filling lesions also. I will discuss these entities in my next talk. So, what is left? There is a big group of ILDs are left now only. They are pneumoconiosis. I will discuss very shortly about the common pneumoconiosis which are pneumoconiosis is uh, to Say briefly, it is occupational hazard of giving occupational diseases giving rise to interstitial lung disease. Pneumoconiosis may be classified as either fibrotic or non fibrotic according to the presence or absence of fibrosis. So, what are fibrotic pneumoconiosis? Silicosis, coal worker pneumoconiosis, asbestosis, berylliosis and talcosis are examples of fibrotic pneumoconiosis and on the other hand siderosis, stenosis and baritosis are non-fibrotic forms of pneumoconiosis that results from inhalation of iron oxide, tin oxide and barium sulphate particles respectively. So fibrotic group and non-fibrotic group and fibrotic group is more common as well as more important. The most important form of fibrotic pneumoconiosis is coal worker pneumoconiosis and in, in its most benign or most indolent form is called anthracosis which in this anthracosis we can see only carbon laden macrophages accumulation in the lung parenchyma and without being exposed to coal work or without being a coal worker, anthracosis can also be there in urban population living in polluted areas as well as in smokers. As you can see in our uh, patient um, population, any lung, uh, lung biopsy in non neoplastic, any non neoplastic lung biopsy shows carbon laden macrophages accumulation, 
to a uh, to some extent so this is anthracosis group which can be of coal workers and can be of smokers can be of urban habitat also next stage is simple coal worker pneumoconiosis where coal macules and coal nodules are formed with upper lobe predominance or upper part of lower lobe can also be involved and another subgroup is complicated cwps where progressive massive fibrosis will be there in most of the subtypes of pneumoconiosis the ultimate or uh, the grave end is progressive massive fibrosis next is silicosis initially silicosis can uh, gives rise to uh, tiny nodules in lung and also in mediastinal lymph nodes very tiny nodules next hard collagenous scars are formed and in radiology silicosis uh, gives rise to a typical pattern of fine calcification which are called egg shell calcification and ultimately as i have already said there is progressive massive fibrosis and this image of silicosis is showing a late stage of of collagenous silicotic nodules collagenous silicotic nodules are there next is asbestosis asbestosis is a long term inflammation and scarring of the lungs due to asbestos fibers and symptoms may include shortness of breath cough wheezing and chest tightness and not like other um, type of pneumoconiosis asbestosis is more commonly related with lung cancer mesothelioma and pulmonary heart disease and what is there in asbestosis diffuse pulmonary interstitial fibrosis and asbestos bodies can be seen in biopsy in lung biopsy there is golden brown fusiform or beaded rod shaped structures which are called asbestos bodies and there can be pleural plaques also next which is left therapy induced interstitial lung diseases first of all drug induced cases and common drugs or giving rise to ild are cytotoxic drugs like bleomycin amiodarone is a known culprit for ild and intravenous drug abuse can also be a cause of interstitial lung disease and therapy induced apart from drug there can be radiation induced ild and in acute form it, it is acute radiation induced ild is nothing but a type of hypersensitivity pneumonitis and in chronic form there is pulmonary fibrosis and diffuse alveolar damage now collagen vascular disease also give rise to interstitial lung diseases and what are the common patterns uh, according to the common um, connective tissue diseases in systemic sclerosis there is commonly nsip and in the right hand section there is uh, radiological features mentioned ground glass opacification basilar prominence etc and uip feature can also be there where peripheral and bibasilar retic reticulo nodular opacities can be there and honeycombing also so system sclerosis nsip uip both ra also uip is more common but nsip can be there in polymyositis dermatomyositis group nsip uip cryptogenic organizing pneumonia all can occur diffuse alveolar damage also in jogren nsip or LIP lymphocytic in SLE acute interstitial pneumonia AIP can occur and in MCTD mixed connective tissue disease there is NSAIP next before conclusion the role of ball fluid examination in interstitial lung disease ball fluid cannot contribute in all the subtypes but 
if there is eosinophil more uh, more than 25 percent eosinophilic lymphocyte if is increased a, a broad spectrum of disease sarcoid from sarcoidosis to lymphoproliferative disorders if neutrophils are more acute diffuse alveolar damage pulmonary infection etc if bloody fluid is there pulmonary hemorrhage diffuse alveolar hemorrhage which these entities we will discuss in the next talk and high hemosiderin score of, of course in hemorrhagic conditions and cd1 a positive cells more than 4% langerhans cell histocytosis pulmonary milky fluid pulmonary alveolar proteinosis, proteinosis and of course if malignant cell is there pulmonary malignancy well, one is the like blood parameters not very not at all specific but microcytic anemia occurs in occult pulmonary hemorrhage and eosinophilia in eosinophilic leukocytosis in infections and malignancies thrombocytopenia in sarcoidosis hypercalcemia again in sarcoidosis and creatinine increased in connective tissue diseases and sarcoidosis liver function deteriorate in sarcoidosis or amyloidosis as well as ctds urine abnormal sediment with rbc cast in vasculitis muscle and joint increased in polymyositis dermatomyositis group increased ac in sarcoidosis and this are common blood parameters non specific but there are some suggestions now there are some novel biomarkers also in DP, dpld i will not uh, molecular markers will probably be discussed in some another talk by uh, another speaker so i'll just mention a few names ccl18 mmp7 cx cl12 mmp12 these are effective biomarkers for predicting severity and progression of lung involvement in systemic sclerosis or scleroderma and serum uh, it is not uh, kl6 it is il6 il high il6 will in indicate uh, interstitial lung diseases and ca153 serum level is strongly elevated in patients with ild also so what are uh, to summarize um, as in, in, this is not take home because we, most of us are sitting in home so it is key for message dpld is not primarily surgical pathology domain as i have said in the beginning we can play a supportive role only and areas like granulomatous lesions collagen vascular disease eosinophilic pneumonia etc need significant lab diagnostic support and on the other hand ipa and other iips are mainly clinical radiological and biopsy is done only in cases of diagnostic confusion and clinical details and radiological features are absolutely necessary as so is generous biopsy and histomorphologically alone is not diagnostic at all and many iips have overall uh, overlapping histological features so what a surgical pathologist can do he or she can play an important member of multidisciplinary team only with this i conclude my discussion on interstitial lung disease thank you thank you all very much thank you so much wonderful presentation dr shukanto excellently put up uh, the entities are very many and the reason why we have chosen this topic in the entire spectrum of all respiratory diseases and to include them in this entire thing is that with the increasing uh, frequency of lung biopsies and the more we are getting used to doing lung biopsies we are soon or later going to see, be seeing more of these non neoplastic lung biopsies as well yes. so it is very important for us in in our setting to start getting used to because lung biopsies we always to think it's neoplastic yes but things are going to change over a period of time as the radiologists the interventional radiologists the surgeons the physicians are getting more and more comfortable with lung biopsies as they are becoming more and more comfortable getting used to handling the various uh, minor complications of lung biopsies they will become more and more aggressive in trying to reach out to the lung in all sorts of lesions not only neoplastic but also inflammatory interstitial 
bronchialveolar. So it's become very important for us to address this. And I, I can uh, let me congratulate you. You have done a wonderful job in trying to put the entire thing in perspective. So nicely you have taught us like a teacher, you know, one by one trying to repeat it again and again so that we all understand the subject very well right from the beginning till the end. And we will surely see you on Friday with the alveolar filling lesions, which are because both of them are, you know, they, they complement each other. Yeah. And uh, and they they're not they're not you know uh, far apart, so that will complete the entire gamut of these bronchoalveolar lesions, and then we will be able to understand things well. And then Saturday there's another talk by another person who's a specialist respiratory pathologist, internationally famed, who will then tell us exactly what is happening on the international you know arena on these areas. So that we become completely wiser and com we know the exact substance very well. Thank you, Dr. Shukanto. There are no questions, as I can see, neither on the YouTube nor on the on the Google Meet. Thank you so much for this wonderful presentation and thank you for taking out time from such a busy schedule. You are such a busy pathologist in Calcutta. To take out time for teaching is a wonderful job. God bless you. Thank you so much. Take care. See you on Friday. Good night. Bye bye. Thank you, sir. Good night. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye.